security of the Constitution of the United States. All right. Now, there's probably some curiosity about the story. And I've never really actually gone through and, and told too many people this entire story of what happened. But I'm sure there's some curiosity of the story with the gun, the suicide attempt, and the convenience store um, that brought on seven cop cars. Um, let me just start off by telling you there was no illegal intent <laughs> with me between the gun and the convenience store. It was it was simply um, a strange circumstance. But let me go back and tell you the story of what led to it. Um, I've talked about. Um, that I had a uh, nervous breakdown that lasted a whole year. I jumped in a truck and went out to California um, one night in a moment of desperation and drove from New York to California straight through. Um, I went to live with somebody I had met um, just online, never met this person in real life, but they said, come on out, you know, live with us. And so I went out to this area, and it was um, an area in Bakersfield, California. A, uh, not a very nice area, very gang-related. Um, there was the uh, gang side, you know, gang signs being flashed of east side, west side. <laughs> And I was told, well, don't wear these colors <laughs> or that color. You know, it's like, yeah, screw that. Um, anyway, this is the area that I was in. And I went out there in, in November. It was, it was toward, it was right before Thanksgiving. And the event that I'm going to tell you about occurred on the night of January 7th, <laughs> 2007. And I was despondent, um, obviously. If I wanted to kill myself, I was despondent. And my roommate had a, uh, it was a Colt 45. Um, she had it in the, in the closet. I knew where it was. And I went into the bedroom. It was close to midnight. And grabbed the Colt 45 and a magazine, loaded magazine and put the magazine in the weapon, put it in my waistband, and walked outside. And what I was wearing when I walked outside was um, a pair of jeans, a t-shirt, and this very light, um, just kind of, it wasn't even really a cardigan, it was um, this mesh kind of thing that I was wearing. And it was January, it was cold. Um, but. I was despondent and I walked outside and I didn't really care about the cold because I figured I was going to be killing myself soon anyway. I went walking and I was walking and I didn't really know the area because I hadn't um, been going outside. I hadn't been walking around. I knew nothing about the area so I just started walking. And what I was looking for was a place where they wouldn't find the body. Um, so I was looking at um, the washes and, you know, any, any area where I thought, well, you know, are they not going to find the body here? And that, that was what was in my mind. Um, as I was walking, um, there was actually a car that pulled over and it was some guy looking for, you know, a prostitute. <laughs> and he kind of drove by and, and slowed down and looked at me and then um, sped off. I guess I wasn't what he was he was looking for. And I just kept walking and walking and walking and walking. And then I, you know, I finally, I got to a point, I did, had no idea where I was. And it was freezing. I was absolutely freezing. I was numb. I was cold. And I was thinking, I'm tired now, and I'm kind of losing my, 
uh, desire to actually do this. <laughs> All I want to do is go home and uh, get in bed. I, I'm tired now. I, I've kind of lost my commitment to um, doing this. But I kept going and I didn't know where I was. I had no idea where I was. I had no idea how to get back home. And there, it wasn't, all it was was a residential area. There wasn't even lights, you know, at that point. And I um, got to this, I don't know, one corner, and I thought, I'm just going to do it here. Fuck it. And I tried to pull the slide back on the 45, but my hands were too numb. I couldn't do it. I tried and I tried and I tried and it, I, I would get the pull, I would get the slide about halfway back and I couldn't pull it anymore because my hands were completely numb. I was freezing to death. And I was, you know, I was just crying at that point. I was like, seriously, I can't even do this. I can't do anything. And so I walked just a little ways more and I saw these lights. And it was lights to a church. It was um, actually spotlights to this giant rock. I'm not sure what the rock meant in front of this church, but there was these two spotlights, huge spotlights, on top, uh, go, pointing to this rock. And so I walked up to it, and I thought, well, if nothing else, these lights seem really warm. And I sat on one, <laughs> um, and put my hands over the other just to try to warm myself. And I sat there trying to think, what am I going to do? I have no idea where I am. I don't know how to get home. I didn't have a phone. I, I've never carried a cell phone. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was thinking, uh, I'm just going gonna to freeze to death. That's what's going to happen. And as I'm sitting there warming myself on these lights in front of this church, I thought, well, if I wait till morning, maybe like a preacher or pastor or something will pull up and I'll be able to ask for help. Um, I sat there for about an hour or two, maybe. And, you know, we're talking maybe 3 o'clock in the morning. And I, I thought, I just got to keep going. So I did. I just started walking again. And I was walking a ways and there was a... Um, a market that, I don't know, it must have been an all-night market or something. Um, but I went in there because I really had to pee at that point. <laughs> um, so I went in and asked if there was a bathroom. And they said, yeah, well, there's one in the back. It was a very strange market. And so I went back and went to the restroom. It was, I mean, it was back in the... In the employee area, it was back in the warehouse area, that I went to the restroom and I came back out. And I asked the, uh, the girl who had told me where the bathroom was, and she was one of the checkout girls, and asked her if, for help. But at that point, I mean, I was, I was so despondent, and, and I was so, I was dealing with gender dysphoria. I had just changed my persona from male to female and just dealing with so much crap <laughs> that I had difficulty actually communicating and intera interacting. Um, but she said, no, I can't help you. So I, I just continued on my way. Now, I went outside and there was nothing. I mean, seriously, nothing. Total darkness. And I see in the distance this light. And so I walked toward the light. You know, what else are you going to do like a moth? I walked to this light. And it was a convenience store that was up on a corner. And I went to the convenience store. I have no idea what time it was. But, um, you know, 4.30. Yeah, 3.30, 3 4.30, somewhere around there. And walked in and just said, I need you to call the police. That's what I said to the guy. <laughs> and, you know, he, you know, freaking sweet, he said, no, you go outside. And I'm like, no, I need you to call the police for me. I need help. And he said, no, go to the payphone. I don't have any money. I have nothing. You, 
I, you don't understand. I need help. Please call the police. And he said, no, go outside. Go to the payphone. And so I walked outside. I went to the, you know, and the payphone was there. And I, I didn't have any change. I couldn't call. And so I just sat on the curb and I just started crying. <laughs> and a couple minutes later, this cop pulled up. But he pulled up at the gas pump. And I was thinking, well, the guy must have called. He must have got concerned and called the police. And, but that wasn't the case. So I walked over to the police car, and the policeman rolled down the window. And he said, can I help you, ma'am? And I said, I want to kill myself. <laughs> and he, you know, became concerned, obviously. And he said, are you armed? And I said, yes. And he said, back up. So I did. And he got out of the car. And he, you know, I, I think he might have asked, you know, what do you have? And I said, I have a gun. And he said, where is it? It's in my pants. <laughs> and um, he said, put your hands on your head. And I did. And I was facing him still at that point. And I think I was midway now between the convenience store and the gas pumps. And he, um, he was very nice. I mean, this guy was so nice. But he had pulled his weapon. I have a weapon now drawn on me. And my hands over my head, clasped over my head. And he said, I want you to turn around very slowly. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I did. And he said, I'm going to reach for the weapon. I do not want you to move. And I'm like, okay. And he grabbed the weapon and he, um, you know, took the magazine out and um, made sure there wasn't a round in the chamber and all that good stuff. And then a couple moments later, there's six cop cars pull up. I mean, it was like a scene out of cops. It was it was crazy. Lights going, and, you know, they all pull up. And among them was the watch commander. And so I'm not sure who cuffed me. I think it was the guy who initially um, I was dealing with. He, you know, asked me to turn around, and somebody cuffed me. Um, so here I am handcuffed. And the watch commander came over and said, come on, I'm going to put you in my car. Um, and so, the, you know, he put me in, in the car. And, you know, it was, it was really <laughs> quite amazing how gentle everyone was with me, um, considering the circumstance. But, you know, I'm sitting in, in the back of the car, and, and those cars are not made for somebody my height. If you're five foot six, it's probably okay. But um, someone who is six foot one does not fit well in the back of a police car. So very uncomfortably, I'm sitting back there. And the watch commander goes back over to the rest of his guys, and they start talking among themselves. And the worst part for me, <laughs> to be honest, of all these things that were going on, and all this madness that was going on, the thing that... I remember most as being the most negative was there was an APB that came over the radio for me and it was um, my roommates had called and said you know, this, you know she has a gun and she's you know out there and blah 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 and so an APB came out and it was my name and it said transvestite ah seriously you just called me a transvestite I that <laughs> You know, of all things, it probably shouldn't have been my major concern. But sitting in the back of that police car, I was like, you motherfuckers. <laughs> um, that, I don't know, that just sticks out to me. So then the um, watch commander comes back, and he gets into the car, and he starts the car, and we, and we start pulling out. And he, he turns around, and he says, I'm not taking you to the police station. I'm taking you to the hospital, sweetie. And I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> and so we did. We went to we went to the hospital. And then when we got to the hospital, I, I walk into the hospital with him. And I'm still cuffed. And he turns me over to the nurses, um, cuffed. 
and from there they take me up to the uh, psych ward and it's there that my handcuffs are removed. Now once in the um, psych ward, now I've been in psych wards before, but um, now once in the psych ward, they weren't sure what to do with me. This is the first time I've ever been in the psych ward actually having it being known that I'm transgender. Actually having um, been in some presentation of my preferred gender expression um, and they weren't sure what to do with me. I went through and I had to have, which is always very um, icky, um, please strip down when you see you, you know, check you for boo-boos and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and that's always, that's always terrible to have to strip down. But I did that in a side room. It was just, you know, it's just one, one psychologist. Nurses, I think. And they were like, and this is the middle of the night or early morning. And they're like, what do we do with you? We can, you know, do we put you with the guys? We can't put you with the guys. And, do, well, we can't really put you with the girls. And so they stuck me in the padded room. And so I spent actually three nights um, sleeping in the padded room. <laughs> You know, just like you see in the movies, the padded room. And um, I I was allowed out during the day, but I had to go there at night to sleep. And the worst thing about the padded room is there's no way out. <laughs> there's, there's no doorknob on the inside of the padded room. You can't get out if you have to pee. Um, and that's always my biggest concern. I always have to pee. Um, so, yeah. And then uh, after those three nights, they're like, okay, we got somebody who's really crazy. We have to lock him up. So you're going to have to go um, now stay with the guys. And that's what I did. And this was back in 2007. Things, things have changed a little bit, I hope, since then. But this is the way it was then. But um, anyway, that is, my, uh, that is my story of the... Uh, the suicide attempt, the handgun, and the convenience store. It had nothing to do with um, anything illegal, <laughs> other than it's illegal to try to kill yourself. That, that was the illegal part of what I was doing, but uh, I wasn't trying to rob the convenience store <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. And, um, you know, after, the, after um, all was said and done, nobody thought I... Nobody thought I was. They, they all knew that I was just seeking help. So there you go. <laughs>